Hello viewers and welcome back to another episode of The Model Guy. In this episode I'll be doing something slightly different. YouTube is full of videos of people building the newest and greatest kits. However, I thought it would be fun to challenge myself and go back to an older kit from actually 1977 and see what we could do with it to update the kit. I picked up this Tamiya M5 kit off Amazon for only $15 and only a few days later at the Model Club meeting I was lucky enough to pick up a resin kit for it that was part of an estate clear out after the passing of a fellow modeler. Because this is an older Tamiya kit, it actually has gaps where it would have tracks for a motorized version as a toy, but that leaves some gaps in the hull that you'll have to fill if you're not motorizing it. One thing I had to keep in mind when I was building this kit and modifying it was that the M5 tanks that served in Normandy had the sand guards removed from the tracks in most photos. So I would have to be very cautious of where I've modified this kit so any work could be hidden and blend in with the model. I found an article from Fine Scale Magazine from the early 90s by a fellow named Ron who had done the same modification and included the blueprints for the missing panels and the material you would need to make an M5A1 early version. I printed off the blueprints and scaled them to the model and then traced them onto styrene to be cut out and glued. The blueprints were a good start, but there were some modifications I had to make with some sanding to get them to fit perfectly. With the war waging on and a shortage of Continental radial engines, Cadillac suggested to the Ordnance Department of the U.S. Army that they should try putting twin Cadillac engines into an M3 Stuart for better performance and for more availability. In autumn of 1941, a standard M3 Stuart was converted for testing as the M3 E2 and proved successful. This made a trouble-free 500-mile trial trip, and the Cadillac-powered vehicle proved easy for the drivers to operate and control. With the M5 entering service, it was quickly discovered that it was severely undergunned and underarmored when facing German tanks. The standard 37mm gun on the Stuart had only a slim chance of penetrating the standard German Panzer IV tank armor, and absolutely no chance it later on in Normandy against Panthers and Tiger tanks with the German Army. After the disaster of the Castorine Pass, the U.S. Army rethought the use of their light tanks and only used the M5s as a recon vehicle and for close infantry support. Even though the M5 Stuart performed well in the Pacific Theater against the Japanese Army, by the end of 1943, most Marine Corps tank crews had been switched to the M4 Sherman, preferring the hitting power of the 75mm gun. Stuart crews that were fighting in Europe continued to use the M5 right up until the end of the war. Even though its replacement, the M24 Chaffee, had started to enter service in November of 1944. In a report written in January of 1945, General Eisenhower himself concluded that the Stuart was obsolete in every respect as a fighting tank. The M24 replacement wasn't much better. Even though it boasted a 75mm gun, it was still under-armored when compared to the German tanks it was fighting. The M24 entered service too late to really be a deciding factor in the European war, but it did continue on to Korea where it was also undergunned and under-armored compared to the T-34-85 tanks it was fighting. You may have noticed in the video that I'm now adding some parts to the kit that are not included in the Tamiya package, and they've been donated from various kits in the stash. The transmission you see installed and these seats are out of a Revel 1994 Cobra Mustang kit. I'm not trying to scratch build the entire interior of the tank here. I'm just adding a few details so when the people look at the tank and try to look past the figures that'll be in it, there's a little bit in the tank to add some depth. A twisted copper wire and the phone from the kit complete the radio set. I reused the Thompson submachine gun from the mortar team and cut the stock off as this was a common modification made by tank crews. By removing the stock, this allowed the crew more mobility when entering and exiting the tank. I've only just started to paint miniatures, so this was a good opportunity to practice small detailed painting. Did I mention that this kit was originally molded in 1977? Even by today's standards, it still has a great fit in most areas, and there's only a few modifications you have to make to get everything to come together nicely. That's still better than most Revel kits that are released today. Most of Tamiya's early tank kits didn't have any detail at all for the interior, and that's not an issue if you're building the kit with all of the hatches closed. However, I planned on building this one with the hatches open, so I had to come up with something to fill in for the empty turret. You'll notice later in the video that I actually used the mortar from this kit to fill in for the breach of the 37mm gun. 
I really lucked out when I found this resin kit in the stash that was brought into the club meeting because this 30 cal has some great detail and there's also a lot of other bits and pieces you can put on the tank to add interest. Here I've clipped off the handle and trigger from the kit's 30 cal to add to the resin gun. I drilled out the bottom of the mount and added a piece of soldering wire in there so I could remove it and replace it for fitting before painting and committing it to the model. All these bits and pieces you now see in the tank are donated from either the Tamiya kit or the 94 Mustang, and that's actually a bazooka that's been used as a drive shaft towards the transmission. It may look slightly weird right now with everything in primer, but you have to remember most of this isn't going to be visible once the crew are in place. Although I've had issues in the past using Vallejo's airbrush paint with having to add some other chemicals to get it to lay nicely and thin properly, I do like their paints they've released for painting miniatures because they're self-leveling and you can simply put them on with a brush and a little bit of water. Before I glue the hull together, I'm just painting the tips of these mortar rounds brass to give the illusion that they're actually tank rounds, but these again are from the kit. Now that I'm gluing the top half of the hull in place, you can see underneath where that styrene sheet was placed to fill in the gap left where the motorized treads would go. And now I turn to my new favorite material, Perfect Plastic Putty, to fill in the gaps. Because this putty is water-based, after it's been drying for about half an hour, you can simply come in with a wet cotton bud and just wipe away the excess. And I advise that you just do it slightly dampened so you can just do more passes, removing a little bit of a time, rather than soak it and taking too much away. You'll see here in a few minutes why I've left the wheels to spin when mounting them to the tank. One thing that to me is left out of this kit on the sides of the hull are the weld seams from the armor plate coming together at the factory. So what I've done first is taken a razor saw to scribe a line in the tank where I want to put the weld. With that guide in place, I can simply put some stretch sprue down and then soak it with Tamiya Extra Thin. And while it's still wet, I'm going to come in with my blade and just make some tiny slaps onto the seam to give the impression of a welding bead. The nice thing about welding is that it's an art and some people can do it and some people can do it well. And one of the things welders won't tell you is that if it's a bad weld they can usually hide it with a grinder. So don't worry if your welds on the tank don't look perfect. It will just add more character to the tank. Here I'm just repeating the same process on the sloped armor of the front of the tank. Don't worry if you're having trouble seeing it now because once you add in some panel liner it'll stand right out. By adding another layer of liquid cement, that actually takes away the dust and just softens the weld a little bit more. With the welds now in place and all the plates glued together, it's now time to come in and unify everything with some surfacer. Unfortunately, one thing I didn't record was modifying the fenders, but you can see they've been shortened and rounded off to match how the tank looked in Normandy. Another favorite tool I have is this stencil from RB Productions, and instead of getting in there and trying to make tiny white squiggles, this gives me a more random splatter pattern, and it gives me an excellent base to do black basing prior to bringing in my main colors. Once you have your black basing down, you'll want to come in with your thin down paint and slowly add layers until you get a transparency that you like. I plan on building a diorama based in June 1944, so I haven't weathered this tank too harshly. In a few videos, I've had people mention the bubbles in my airbrush while I'm painting, and that's actually because while I'm painting, every so often I'll block the end and remix the paint to make sure it's not settling while I'm applying it to the paint, especially during long sessions. Remember earlier when I left my wheels free spinning when I glued them in place? That's so I can paint them a little bit easier. So as they dry, I can rotate them around to get all 360 degrees of the wheel. If you've left the wheels free spinning, this allows you to cheat a little bit if you don't have a steady hand for detail painting. So just hold the brush in place against the rim and then you can just spin the wheel. One of the challenges I faced when building this tank was just the simple fact that it's green. That's it. Everything is green except for the road wheels. So how do you make that interesting? And one of the ways I've done that is to bring in a little bit of silver paint for dry brushing to put some wear and tear on the bogies. If this thing's busting through hedges in Normandy, you can count on there being some scratches to the paint. This is one of my first tanks that I've built, and one thing I've noticed watching videos online is it seems that there's more of an artistic style people use when painting tanks. They'll do shading, modulating their light, and things like that. But I wanted the tank to look a little more realistic and to use my style. I'm not a fan of doing post shading, and I'm not a fan of trying to modulate light. I want this to look a little more realistic, and in my opinion, the best way to do that is to just paint the tank how it would have been painted. If you don't agree with that, or think that I'm wrong, leave your opinion in the comments section below and tell me why. Maybe there's something I'm missing, and maybe that's just the style.
But the beauty of YouTube is there's many different ways to do things. One of the ways I thought I could make the tank more interesting would be to add gouges from bullets hitting it. It's not painted with the same paint of Captain America's shield, so a bullet hitting that is going to leave a mark. So by using my Dremel, I plan just to tap it in a few places to kind of give the impression of scattered machine gun fire hitting the tank. The important part of doing anything like this to a tank is it should tell a story. So maybe these gouges on the side of the tank are from a ricochet from a German anti-tank gun not hitting at the right angle to destroy it. And now to make those stand out a little bit more, I'm going to add some silver paint to show the steel underneath. This may seem bright right now, but once I add some weathering and flat coat, that'll dull it up a little bit and make it look a little more realistic. I've only added the bullet damage to the one side of the tank instead of putting it everywhere all over or scattered randomly. Here I felt like it was a little more concentrated, like somebody was actually trying to hit the bow gunner. Now let's get back to the history. After the Allies landed in Normandy on D-Day, they faced an issue of fighting in Hedgerow country. If you've seen the pictures of the hedgerows in Normandy, you'll understand that when the Allied tanks pushed into them, instead of just plowing right through the hedges, they climbed up first before the weight of the tank brought the hedges down. But unfortunately, during those few seconds that the tank was showing its belly, German anti-tank gunners were able to knock out the tanks. And it wasn't until good old boy Sergeant Cullen down on the beach realized he could make hydro cutters after talking to his friend at home, and then the Rhino tank was born. With the hedgerow cutters, the tanks were now able to pull up the hedges and push straight through and surprise the Germans when they were no longer showing their bellies. These hedge cutters were actually made in the field initially, and I tried to replicate the rough cuts of an acetylene torch. The Cullen cutter was demonstrated for General Omar Bradley, and when he seen them in action on an M4 Sherman, he knew that they now had the advantage and could get out of Normandy. And after only a few days, they were starting to be prefabricated in England and shipped over to the troops. And it was ironic that it was the beach defenses laid down by the Germans that the Americans stole the steel from to build the cutters, and the Brits followed suit. With the tanks now equipped to get out of hedgerow country, they were now ready to start Operation Cobra. As I stated before, I'm new to figure painting, and I figured that all the extra details on this kit would be a great practice to get in here and try to get some tight areas with paint. That way, when I'm starting to paint shoulder patches or even smaller details, it's not a total mess on the figures. One of the advantages of this resin kit is that I was able to pre-paint everything before gluing it in place. I figured that would have made things more difficult trying to paint with more things in the way. Here I'm using a fine tip brush to add the snaps, buttons, and buckles to the equipment on the front of the tank. You'll notice quite a few Allied tanks have tank tracks or sandbags on the front, and that was just to add additional protection for the crew inside. With the resin pieces starting to be glued into place, I've now felt that the tank was really starting to get some character. Although I do have to question the crew leaving spare magazines for the sidearms out on the front of the tank instead of down inside with them. To give more depth to the sandbags and aftermarket items on the front of the tank, it was now time to use some panel liner to bring it out. Because this was all gloss coated after painting, I was able to remove the panel liner easily with a cotton bud. One criticism that Tamiya kits have always had is that their decals are too thick. The way I get around this is after I've added two or three clear layers on top of the decal, I will sand away the carrier film that's on that decal to try to level it out. Once I've sanded it down and the feel that the carrier film's gone, I'll then recoat it once or twice with clear coat and it should sit level now with the paint. Now when you come in to add your weathering afterwards, you won't have a step there from the carrier film and everything should look painted on. One of the interesting things about the Stuart tank is that its career didn't end at the end of World War II, and it actually went on to fight in several other conflicts with other countries until almost 1968. Even today, M3 Stuart tanks still serve in the country of Paraguay for training tank crews. I haven't done a diorama before, so I didn't want to do the complete weathering on this tank until it was on the diorama, and I could tie it all together with some weathering. So what you're seeing here is only a little bit of the weathering process that this tank will get. Now that I'm putting the black panel liner in place, you'll also be able to see that those welds will start to stand out a little bit better that I put in earlier on the tank. 
I've been asked several times in the comments section what the order of painting is I do before I do my weathering. And it's simple. After I have my decals and colors in place and I'm happy with that, I'll put down two layers of X22 clear by Tamiya, and that's a lacquer clear. So once you start putting your enamels on top, you have a protective coat that allows you to wipe everything clean that you don't like. One interesting technique I found in a few YouTube videos that armor builders use for weathering is to spray thin down oil paint out of their brush by using the airbrush to push it through to get a spattered effect. And I thought that it looked very natural and actually added quite a little more depth to the model. One side effect I wasn't really expecting but liked was the textured ads underneath the like built up mud. One of my weaknesses with painting aircraft is having the guns look realistic. So this time around, I used Tamiya's XF1 black paint as the base for that flat look, and then came in with the steel pigment color afterwards and brushed that on to try to lighten it up and give it more of a metallic sheen that you would see on an actual machine gun. And I feel that this actually worked pretty well, and it's probably a technique I'll use in the future until the next thing comes along that I like and works better. If you don't have the pigment, another thing you could probably use would be crushed up graphite from a pencil. And I also put it on the submachine gun as well just to see if that helped. And with the furniture brown, it actually did add some contrast. It's hard to see from this angle, but you can see that that toothpick is up inside the gun mount. And the reason for that is that there's a little piece of soldering wire that's sticking out on the mount of the tank. And that allowed me to place it for rig up. And now that it's painted, I can actually drop it back down and use that as a guide to hold it in place with a little bit of super glue. One of the things that Tamiya does with their kits is they give you rubber tank tracks. And I think that's just to make them easier to install for people because they do sit nicely in place and you just have to melt the plastic tabs to have them seat properly. The only drawback is you don't get that realistic sag that you would see in tank tracks. There's a lot of aftermarket options out there like Fruling and some other manufacturers that build steel link tracks. But like I said, I only spent $15 on this kit and I didn't want to be spending 50 to get them mailed here to have a, just a little bit of sag on the track. Now, if you're wondering where I got the number 50 from, you have to remember I live in Canada where our dollar is about 74 to 75 cents to the American dollar. So once you have your exchange rate and your shipping rates, things get pretty expensive. So if you can cut some corners in some places, we definitely try to do it. Even with the resin pieces added onto the tank, I wanted to add a little bit more detail and a little more contrast to that green. So one of the things I did was search online and I found that on YouTube, Shane Smith, who does some great miniature painting, also did a tutorial of how to build an ALQ air recognition panel for a tank. I'll post a link in the description of this video so you can find that tutorial as well. And basically, you're just going to use some tin foil, fold it up, a little bit of Tamiya tape, and you're going to make yourself a nice canvas panel and the reason tanks would have this panel is so aircraft could recognize that there were friendly tanks below. This was also something that the airborne troops carried, and even today pilots carry it in survival kits to have contrast to the ground and make them easily spotted from the air. These panels came in several different colors, but one of the most common ones I've seen in colorized photos was the orange, so that's the route I decided to go with. Now that it's loosely put in place, I'll put some saran wrap between the tank and the aluminum so I can paint it with Mod Podge to harden it up slightly and bend it around some of the objects it'll be sitting on. Because these panels were made of canvas, it doesn't sit smoothly on the tank, so you're going to have some areas where it sits up. So it's important that you paint one side with a ghost gray or an off-white just so it's more realistic and you don't have just shiny tinfoil sticking out or else you've wasted your time. So now I'm just painting the edges of the panel and then re-gluing it in place. You can even go as far as having pinholes and tying that panel down, but I decided just to put some loose equipment on it that would hold it in place. And this is the last batch of resin equipment that's been painted with the Vallejo model colors, just to add some more contrast to that green. And I realized after gluing the panels in place that those bow gunner and driver hatches are incorrectly mounted and they should be vertical and also painted the same olive drab as the tank. So with the last pieces of equipment going into place, the last thing that's needed on the tank is the antenna. So to recreate that, I just simply stretch some sprue, just heat it up until it looks like it's getting uh, like almost like a water texture on it. And then you just slowly pull it apart and that gives you a nice thin plastic to work with. And it'll actually stand up straight as well when you glue it in place. 
once this was glued in place on the tank, I just simply painted it with some Vallejo German Grey. And then the tank part of the diorama was ready to go. That wraps up the tank part of this build. And as always, if you liked it, click like, hit subscribe if you want to see more videos. If you didn't like it, let me know why in the comment section below. This is the Model Guy closing out another video, and I'll see you next time.